Hello and welcome to downtown. This is your host, Robbie Haig. Thank you for being here, as usual. Uh, we uh, today will be talking with Dr. John Zabron, who is a senior medical officer for Achieve TMS East. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope you don't mind me calling you John. No, please do. That's Excellent. And we would, uh, I, I was at the opening of your new place, very impressed by what I have seen, and I would like you to bring that to us here and let people out there know what TMS is all about. Okay, be happy to. Thank you. Any place you'd like me to start? With Just this? jump in. Okay. <laughs> well, TMS is a relatively new psychiatric treatment uh, available now uh, to the general public uh, for treatment-resistant depression. It stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation, mm -hmm. and it has uh, several advantages, uh, both well, in terms of uh, safety, effectiveness, and in terms of being a new type of treatment uh, that goes beyond psychotherapy and medication uh, treatments that are more commonly available. So this is, um, well, okay, I'll pause here. So I just don't know where you want me to go from. <laughs> it's an adjunct to what has been happening in the past. I um, was familiar with the way things happened way back. And uh, this, this is so much, sounds, sounds and looks so much better than what they have been using in the past. Yes, so this adds, this is a completely new tool uh, uh, and a treatment modality that we have that's very different uh, and also is nothing really like ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, what people sometimes are refer to as shock therapy. This treatment right. is nothing like that. Uh, I don't even compare them in terms of how they work or their, um, their side effects or any of the processes. It's, it's a very different uh, process. Uh, TMS has been FDA approved uh, in this country. Uh, one of the first device, uh, type of device made available in the USA was, is in 2008. Uh, and then that's, recent. that's fairly recent <laughs> from our point of view, yes. And, the, uh, and since then, a, a second type of TMS device, a deep TMS device, has now been, uh, been FDA approved also for depression treatment in 2013. Wow. So now we have um, two different types of devices, uh, ongoing studies, accumulated evidence showing uh, how effective and safe uh, this mm -hmm. treatment is uh, for depression. Uh, typically, uh, the patients that would come to us would be people who have had uh, chronic or recurrent uh, depression, who have tried already usually years of psychotherapy, perhaps different kinds of psychotherapy, and several different antidepressants, either through a primary care provider or through the psychiatrist, and they just have not been able to achieve any well, actually achieve remission to get all the way better, or they've not been able to sustain that. And they and their treatment providers are looking for something in addition. What else could we do to uh, be helpful to this patient, to relieve their depression symptoms? And uh, this has been very attractive to many people because of its safety profile and effectiveness. I was very impressed by watching the demonstration, very impressed by the reaction of the, the patient. It right. was. He was. He looked very comfortable. Yes, this is a. It's is a, It is an outpatient procedure. People drive themselves in and drive out. There's no pre-medication, post-medication. That's complimentary. Pe people are awake during the treatment. There is a oh. technician with them in the room the whole time. Uh, they're what they're actually receiving are pulses of magnetic uh, fields. Uh, that are delivered to the left frontal part of the brain, typically. Mm -hmm. And it's on, on the power spectrum, it's about equal to an MRI magnet type of uh, strength. Okay. But the, uh, as they're rece receiving this, it's, it goes about two seconds or a few seconds in length, and then there's a rest period. During the rest period, they can either talk with the technician or perhaps watch uh, something on, on a screen. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, in typical treatment uh, with our device lasts about 20 minutes, with one of the other devices perhaps 40 minutes, and then they're free to go for the day, and usually with no particular side effects uh, afterwards. I would like to emphasize for those people who perhaps have heard um, stories of other people who have had procedures like ECT in the past that uh, there is no negative effects on cognition. There's no negative effect on cognition in, in this treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, the people find if anything after a couple of weeks they're feeling like their thinking is sharper, clearer um, there uh, and uh, with no memory loss, no, no uh, effect on that. Now, so, how long a period of time is a, we'll call it, session? Right. So is this, is, this does involve some commitment to the mm -hmm. treatment, but most people actually find this uh, not that hard to do once they decide to take the step to get treatment. So the a typical session, as I mentioned, can be from 20 to 40 minutes. With, with our particular device, we, we have people allow, say, tell them to allow about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. They do this five days a week. Uh, wow. for a total of 36 sessions. Okay. Uh, during the end, we do have a, some of the sessions tapering off, but basically for about the first six weeks, we are hoping to have them in five days a week. That sounds like a lot to, to be somewhere that often, but the, the people are, uh, that come in are remarkably uh, motivated and consistent, and they tell us that it's actually not that hard to do once they fit into their schedule, and most of them actually look forward to coming. Well, we, I can uh, see we, why. We, <laughs> it sounds like a very positive. Uh, oh, overall, the experience is very positive. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, there might be some mild discomfort of facial muscles that are also contracting a little with the magnetic field on one side, but that there's some desensitization to that, and uh, overall, the patients like coming in. They like talking with the technicians. Um, and uh, they're, they're happy with the results, too, uh, after a while. The, the typical improvement uh, profile would be something on the order of the first, after about two weeks of treatment. Pa as I mentioned before, a patient may notice their thinking being a little clearer, and the sleep quality might be improved, perhaps the sleep cycle mm -hmm. consolidated. And then from there on, uh, maybe the next week, Stress tolerance might feel like it's a little better. People who know them well, family and friends, think they look better from the outside. And then gra and even the motivation is starting to pick up at a low level, things that they normally would do. They find themselves doing more of those things. And then from there, even further improvement. Uh, the, for the people who are in routine outpatient treatment, that they already have a therapist, that they're in treatment, about 50% of them will achieve remission and will eventually have most of their depression symptoms disappear by the wow. end of treatment. And for psychiatry, especially for treatment-resistant depression, this is a, an excellent result. Uh, wow. We've not had that good of results from a relatively benign uh, and safe procedure bef uh, before. That sounds good. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm linking communication with other people. I mean, going through a procedure like this and then having people who know you say, gee, you look so much better. That yes. has a great deal to do, am I incorrect? A great deal to do with how they see themselves also. Oh yeah, so over time, this is, this is very good. This positive feedback from the environment, it improves hope. I will say it's part, we try to have it as part of the um, treatment structure or, or experience that they're having positive experiences through this. Uh, this is, um, this, people, as I said, people like coming to this, and so the, the whole experience also adds to it. And then, of course, when they start feeling better, uh, the, the family's reaction, friends' reactions, and their ability to socialize more, they, they gain a lot more along the way. It's almost like a positive snowballing effect sure. from this. So if it should happen that within the first six weeks that they don't notice a great deal of change. Can they come back for another treatment? So we have, we do monitor uh, all the way through, and that's uh, standard for uh, basically all TMS treatment settings. 
uh, to make sure that we are making progress. Uh, if, if we do see this, the smaller percentage of people that, let's say by session 20, are not making as much progress as we had hoped, it should be noted a good number of those people will still go to full remission. It just takes them a little longer, and that is harder right. for the people to wait for the, for the progress uh, to, for the, for the improvement to happen. There's some people on the out, they're outliers, but who even have most of their improvement after they finish treatment. Sure. So there's, there's a delay in mm -hmm. the improvement from the treatment uh, time. So, but there are things we can do to try to improve the treatment response in the, in the sort of outer fit, last phases of that if we need to, uh, other things uh, to try. Uh, but again, we have in, in regular, again, outpatients that have come in, been referred to us, 75% of them uh, in studies, it's been shown 75% of them will get at least halfway better, at least 50% wow. better. And for somebody who has been stuck or locked into a right. depression for a long time, that's a dramatic improvement. And it allows right. other things to happen beyond that. More progress can be made in psychotherapy. Perhaps they finally have the motivation to begin to either socialize more or engage in some regular exercise, which is helpful. And so Absolutely. this can help uh, from there for things to happen. Mm -hmm. Insurance-wise, how does this right. work? It, okay, uh, insur the insurance story is actually part of the reason that um, most people don't yet know of this treatment. Uh, as I said, technically, uh, even since back to 2008, this treatment has been available in spots to people who could afford it. Uh, what happened in 2016 was uh, Medicare, after uh, looking at the data repeatedly, uh, made their determination that this was definitely an effective and safe treatment that should be reimbursed. They began reimbursement, uh -huh. and with that, any lingering insurance companies that had not seriously looked at this for, re for, re for payment and reimbursement um, also basically came on board. Uh, so now, uh, this has now become something accessible to all. Even in, this, in the state of Massachusetts, we're particularly lucky. Not only do we have Medicare, but we have MassHealth and some of the other uh, plans also paying for this already. So, so even people who have been uh, chronically disabled with Medicare and Medicaid as their insurances sure. can now get full access to this. Uh, in, in this state. So now we have, in, with the access improving, uh, more and more people can now, are now hearing about it and receiving it, uh, the treatment. And so that is uh, how it came uh, to be covered time-wise. Now, practically speaking, how does someone get um, uh, to be treated and have insurance pay for it, since obviously the vast majority of us would want our insurance uh, to, to cover this, uh, since it's an involved uh, uh, procedure. So the typical scenario now is that uh, the insurance companies want, for prior authorization to receive TMS, want to see three or more, more typically four trials on antidepressant medications or medications of that type mm -hmm. uh, that have been long enough trials uh, and that have not worked. Essentially, okay. people have not been able to reach remission on these medications and for those people to have been in psychotherapy before they will give authorization for this treatment. That sounds like a lot to someone who perhaps has never been treated for depression, but for a lot of depression patients, having been on four medications is now a relatively common experience. They have sure. tried one, side effects were not tolerated, tried another, partial benefit for some symptoms, or if they did even get a fairly good benefit, two years ago the medication sort of faded out in terms of its efficacy. So we have, there's quite a number of patients out there who would actually meet even those rather strict insurance criteria. I would say from an FDA point of view, uh, for example, with our Brainsway deep TMS device that we use at Achieve TMS East, uh, there's only one medication uh, failure uh, stated on the FDA uh, approval uh, uh, documents. So that technically, 
one medication failure is enough from the FDA's point of view to receive this treatment. Uh, in the academic literature, they speak of treatment-resistant depression as uh, failing trials on only two medications. The insurance companies have stretched that more to three or four medications now, but uh, again, there are still a lot of people that already uh, fit those criteria. And we're really talking about people who might have been having this problem for 10 years or better. Or more. Some people really? have been struggling with depression that I, that I see uh, being referred to us for evaluation to see if they're appropriate for treatment mm -hmm. uh, for 20 years or more with wow. sometimes, yes, modest improvement in symptoms, enough to survive and get along, mm -hmm. um, but not remission. Uh, and that's when, when we use uh, TMS, uh, really all providers who are using TMS are really hoping for and looking to get very close to remission and working for that, uh, which again, we have tried in the past. Uh, it's not that psychiatrists have been trying this for years uh, with medications as well, but uh, there are many patients who've experienced the limitations of medications, both in terms of side effects and in terms of what they can do. And we do know from prior studies, such as the old STAR-D study that was one of the largest studies done with uh, sequential antidepressant medication trials, that some people, just statistically speaking, do not seem to be uh, responding to medications. And the more they try, the next medication they try, it's statistically less and less likely that medication will work for them. Right. Uh, this is an ideal option for, for pe people right. in that. Uh, do you track. foresee the possibility of being able to use this new and wonderful Achieve TMS? Uh, without benefit of medication? Prior medication trials? Yes. Uh, that will be up to probably cost management and insurance uh, people, but, uh, but it I, sounds I don't, like it, it's a possibility. I, 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 do, I do not see why it could not. The safety profile uh, is uh, really about equivalent to uh, combination and antidepressant treatment the, in terms of people talk in medicine of the risk-benefit ratio. So uh, this has a very good risk-benefit ratio. I, I will take this opportunity to mention, some people will ask, okay, this sounds like a great treatment, what are the medical risks? And the, the main medical risk once you've been approved for the treatment would be a rel rare, relatively rare um, uh, risk of having a seizure during the treatment. But we're talking about less than one in a thousand now for any type of TMS. Uh, I will mention that pe most people may not be aware of this, but uh, for people on antidepressants, especially when they've maxed out on a dose, uh, I don't want to pick on any one antidepressant uh, here, but there are certain types perhaps that are more likely to cause a seizure, but especially once you're on combination or combinations of medications, perhaps a couple of antidepressants or an antidepressant with uh, an atypical, uh, your risk of seizure is in the same range. And that's, that can happen at any time that you're on those medications, whereas the seizure risk for something like this, which again, is relatively rare, we have very good sort of safety parameters for this mm -hmm. treatment, uh, uh, would be really mainly during the treatment itself. So that risk is no different than, in my mind, um, than combination antidepressant treatment. Um, that said, we do screen people for certain things. There are some people. There are people who, uh, who cannot have this treatment. Really. And the main uh, main obstacle or criterion that would keep them from having it would be magnetic type metal in their head or neck. So the same thing that would block them from having an MRI scan of their head or neck because the main risk would be that the metal could heat up under the repeated um, uh, magnetic field pulses. So uh, this might apply more to people with old shrapnel injuries, factory workers, uh, with, or perhaps very old surgical procedures. 
The more modern uh, neurosurgical and surgical procedures are often using titanium in, in um, either plates in the face or screws in the neck for um, cervical surgery. Uh, these, this is not a magnetic metal, and okay. these are safe to use in MRI scans. Uh, the uh, dental amalgam work does not exclude you from obtaining this treatment. It's really something that's embedded inside of you uh, that would be, uh, and it would be an older type of uh, metal. Um, we've had, uh, we can help people screen through that if there's any question, but it's fairly rare for us to run into people with that uh, now. Uh, for anybody who might be watching this, there's been people with stainless steel um, in their chest from mm -hmm. surgery, that's been fine. Uh, oh, it has? Yes, it's, wow. it's not, it's distant enough from the coils and it's also really not very magnetic in terms of okay. some, some of the alloys that they use. Somebody had a cobalt chromium shoulder prosthesis. Uh, these things, they can be put into an MRI scan and typically with even minimal interference in MRI scan, so, but we can always consult with the primary care providers or surgeons to clarify any questions that might occur with that. So that would be the main thing that would exclude somebody or somebody who has uh, something that would be an increased seizure risk. So for example, somebody who already has epilepsy, a seizure disorder that is not controlled on medications. If somebody has had a seizure within the past six months, if their seizure disorder is not controlled, well, we don't want to be stimulating that possibility sure. of happening. Uh, so that makes some sense when you think about it. It's uh, to, compared to you know, what, what we're doing. Uh, we do, when we do evaluation for anybody coming in, uh, a psychiatric evaluation, that is part of the evaluation to look for any of these possible contraindications. Somebody with extensive neurosurgery, shunt placements, these, these might be problems, but sure. the vast majority of people, this is, these aren't present. Very good. And you are called TMS East, so right. where did this TMS begin? Right, so our company is uh, Achieve TMS East. Uh, our sister company or forerunner company is Achieve TMS in uh, Southern California originally, uh, and they have also expanded some into in larger areas of California. Uh, they were uh, fortunate enough to be able to be active uh, uh, in the earliest days of uh, the um, Brainsway device, deep TMS device being available. And so they have um, started, uh, the experience uh, of the chief TMS companies started there. And uh, we have since been able to bring it out to uh, the East Coast. Uh, we've been active in Massachusetts for over a year now uh, okay. with several different sites. And we focus almost essentially at this point exclusively on the deep TMS uh, type of machine. Um, we can, uh, I can spend a moment explaining that there are two types. Okay. If people are looking online or reading about this, these TMS machines, there's the, um, the earliest type of machine is a surf, we call it a surface TMS machine. Uh, the reason we call it surface is the type of um, coil that generates the magnetic field. It's a figure eight coil, and it al allows the magnetic field to penetrate about two centimeters into uh, the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so it stays more on the surface of the brain. Uh, the rather sophisticated coil design of this uh, uh, Brainsway device um, allows for the penetration of the magnetic field uh, down to as, as much as five or six centimeters and also uh, captures a larger volume of brain tissue um, that to be stimulated, um, which means also in the deep TMS model, um, we, we don't miss the target spot. And also for older patients whose brain may be pulling away from the inner lining of the, of the skull and there may be a little more distance, uh, this, this uh, device uh, can penetrate deeply enough to where w there's no need to increase power levels dramatically or anything mm -hmm. to reach the brain tissue. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we like this device. And these two uh, types have, uh, 
are both available. They both have good data behind them. Both are uh, FDA approved. Um, there has been no formal academic study of these two devices head to head, in case anybody's wondering about that. Uh, but, their, but their FDA um, data is available. Sounds exciting. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we're very excited. We see very nice results uh, with, with our patients. We've had um, some people who, again, have gone decades without feeling normal. It's almost, well, we, we like them to be in therapy because for some of these people, it's such a new experience. It's good for them to have a therapist available to discuss, almost now what do I do? Sure. <laughs> because they're, they're liking this new condition and feeling so better, but um, there actually okay. even is, is some ways to improve one's life, keep the antidepressant effect going, uh, and enhance, um, uh, the the effect positive effects on one's life mm -hmm. uh, we have it's the FDA approval is for so-called unipolar depression which is what most people think of when they think of depression repeated sort of major depressive episodes uh, it is not yet technically FDA approved for bipolar disorder when depressive episodes happen although it is actually fairly widely used um, or, uh, and there are, there are studies uh, uh, with mixed results, not quite the same degree of success in a bipolar uh, uh, context as in a unipolar con regular depression context, mm -hmm. but still we think worth trying um, and when we have ourselves seen good results. So the depression can be uh, present along with other diagnoses such as PTSD. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, it, I will say that if somebody has recently gone through, for example, alcohol detox or detoxification from benzodiazepines such as mm -hmm. Valium, Xanax, there has to be a bit of a wait uh, before we can start such a this, this sort of stimulating um, procedure um, because we don't want to have their, their brains are still not settled from the detoxification and we don't want them to be at risk for uh, seizures. Yeah. Uh, so they're but they can still have the treatment, it's just uh, a delay uh, in that. If they're still actively abusing substances, that is also not the time to be doing this treatment. Okay. So right. if in case anyone has Makes questions sense. about that, yes. <laughs> Makes sense. Right. Yeah. And of course, you know I'm interested in this. I've told you before we started talking that I am a nurse who has been uh, part of all of these ancient horrors oh. and this just sounds so absolutely wonderful. Yes, this, this is a new level uh, and ability to treat uh, in ways that uh, I was very pleased to be able to move into. I, I mean, I have the greatest respect for, uh, the, especially the, the newer generation of medications when uh, used by experts who know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They can make a lot of good uh, improvements with these things. And also we are getting more data now uh, supporting um, the importance uh, that patients have of having all the other wellness strategies in place and the value those have in an antidepressant regimen. But this is um, unique. This works via net networks, pathways in the brain, rather than ingesting a chemical that sort of diffuses through your entire brain. Sure. We have a stimulating frequency for people who are interested in some, a little more technical de details. These is this coming in at at our machine, 18 cycles per second, but basically between 10 and 20 pulses per second to this area of the brain. It is stimulating what I think of really as a more natural type of nerve firing in the brain, uh, unlike perhaps a higher dosage. Well, definitely unlike higher dosage, uh, a higher power ECT that would be causing a seizure. There's no, there's no seizure, what we, we're trying to avoid a seizure. Mm -hmm. This is um, a firing of the brain cells. My metaphor is it, my metaphor that is like making the frontal lobe sprint. Um, it's becoming, it's a part of the brain that typically is uh, underactive in people who are chronically depressed or in the midst of a major depression. You're making it more active. It tends to stay more active uh, over time, even if they study the brain, area after even one session for 30 to 60 minutes after that session that part of the brain stays more active uh -huh. you get this five days a week for six weeks it becomes 
uh, a new level of activity of that brain. Also, these um, nerve cells that fire together, wire together, they become more connected uh, in their activity. And there are other effects downstream. This part of the brain has nerve connections that eventually help regulate the release of stress hormone cortisol, which the pattern of cortisol release in one's body is uh, usually thrown off by depression and by traumatic experiences, and it provides sort of a top-down uh, enhancement of regulating the, the stress hormone release pattern. Um, there's even a couple of studies now showing, uh, one recently just out of South Korea, showing a little bit of weight loss uh, during the uh, first couple of weeks of, of treatment uh, in patients. Um, possibly by stimulating a little uh, brief release of thyroid hormone. So there's multiple uh, ways this works. And um, we're learning more and, and more we're learning and more, more and more about, about it. Yes, exactly. And yeah. this is sort of, and so the downstream effects through the networks are really sort of, they're your networks. It's, an, it's enhancing normal pathways. Uh, wow. So the side effects, once you stop the treatment, are minimal. Some people get a little bit of, fatigue early on in treatment too um, that eventually passes and that's not a bad sign at all. You know, a lot of okay. times we, most of the time we see those people improving anyway. And you used the word stop and I'm looking, we need to stop. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is wonderful. Your information has been fantastic. Okay, all right, so I'm just rambling, so. No, okay. no, 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 it's just been, it's just been wonderful. Okay. And yeah. even if there are a couple of people out there who are watching this who might be interested in, in uh, dealing with it, dealing with the group, you have all of the information here uh, in ways to get in touch with uh, the doctor and his group. Um, thank you so very much for watching. And this is your host, Robbie Haig, saying thank you for being with us, and we hope to see you again real soon.